Well, thank you. It's a joy to be back here in uh, New York, at Times Square. Please be seated. Uh, you know, this is, uh, we are celebrating this week, three and a half decades, a little plus since David Wilkerson founded Times Square Church. And aren't we glad he did? Uh, aren't we glad the Lord put that plant and that seed in his heart? You know, I was thinking, I was thinking when I was just looking at this spectacular worship center in which we meet, all those angels, and when, when these architects planned this and drew it, and, and those constructed it with all the art, artisans that did this beautiful work, little did they know that God had something better in mind for this property in this building. That it reminds us that these angels, the book of Hebrews says what, are ministering spirits sent to minister to those of us who are heirs of salvation. What a blessing to be here, see this building packed on uh, two services and see people from scores and scores and scores of countries as they do every week uh, being a part of us online. Somebody might say, man, I wish David Wilkerson were still alive and he could see Times Square Church now. And you know what? He did see it. And that's why it's here. With the eye of faith and with the vision God gave him to plant this wonderful Bible-believing, soul-saving station right here in the heart of the, one of the greatest world cities uh, the world has ever known. So it's a blessing to be here, and a blessing to be here with your pastor, uh, Tim Delina and his wife, Cindy. You know, Tim preached in Texas, in Dallas, a couple of weeks ago, where we are, and a big commotion came after he preached. He was leaving town on Monday to fly back to New York, and there was a big commotion at the security desk at the airport because all those people from the church in Dallas tried to kidnap him and keep him and not let him come back here to New York. But what a blessing it is to, to know that you're our stewards. You know, the Bible says we're stewards of the gospel. And what a blessing to share your pastor with other people and light the fire in other churches that's burning here at Times Square Church. So it's time to open the book of God to the people of God, and we know that these words are always a savor of life unto life to all who will receive them. Some of you will leave this room today or leave your, tele your computer screens. Having begun today, this morning, right now, the greatest adventure in the Christian life, and you don't even know it yet, but God, the Holy Spirit, is going to speak to each of us at the very specific point of our need, convicting us of sin, convincing us of righteousness. And as Paul said in Romans, the kindness and the goodness of God is going to take us by the hand and lead us to repentance. Some of you are about to begin the greatest adventure you've ever known, knowing Jesus Christ in the free pardoning of sin and finding a brand new life in him. Paul said, Christ in me is the hope of glory. Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 16 and keep your Bibles open there to the 16th chapter of Matthew. You know, some time ago I was devotionally reading through the Gospels as I've done hundreds and hundreds of times over the decades of my own Christian experience. But on this particular time, when I was reading the Gospels, I saw something I'd never seen before. I read it a hundred times. I'd never seen it before. Has that ever happened to you? How the Holy Spirit will just take something, a verse of Scripture, a word of Scripture, and quicken it to you. It's what we call in Greek the rhema, the specific word to a specific person in a specific situation that God gives us by His Spirit through His Word. You know, you know why you can't walk on water? You may have all the faith in, in the world, but you go out and you try to walk across the swimming pool and see how far you get. Peter could. What's the difference? He got a specific word for a specific person in a specific situation. Jesus said to Peter, walk to me on the water. And he acted on the word of God by faith, and he did it. Now, we still have a God who speaks to us by spirit 
Through his word, there are two words in the New Testament. We translate word, W-O-R-D. One is logos, the written word, that which you hold in your hand. The other is this rhema, this specific word to a specific person at a specific situation. And I'm praying today that that's what you get. That God's Holy Spirit speaks to your heart at a point of your need. So I'm reading through the Gospels as I've done, and all of a sudden I saw something I'd never seen before. And you know what it was? The numbers of times that Jesus asked questions. Think about that. He was not just omnipotent and had all power, but he was omniscient, which means he had all knowledge and all foreknowledge. You know, not one time do you read in the Bible where Jesus came upon a situation, somebody was sick or something happened, and he came up and he said, whoa, I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> or not one time do you see Jesus coming upon and say, whoa, wow, boy, man, that was a surprise. That's a shock. He knew everything. He knows everything. He knows everything about your heart. And yet, in the Gospels, he's always asking questions. I counted them. There are 150 at least unique questions that escape the lips of our Lord that are recorded for us in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And John closes his gospel by saying, if everything Jesus had said and done had been recorded, all the books of the world could not contain them. There are 150 of them. You know, a lot of us think that leadership, whether it's at home or at the office or at church or at school or wherever it may be, that, that leadership is, can be characterized by certain punctuation marks. You know, some people think to be a good leader, you ought to be characterized by the period, the command, the mandate. Go here, go there, do this, do that. Just barking orders. Some people think that's what makes a leader. Other people think that leadership is characterized by that exclamation point. Enthusiasm and optimism and expectancy and ability to, to sway crowds and influence people with all kinds of persuasion. But let me tell you something. More often than not, real leaders are characterized by that symbol, when you think about it, that's bent in humility. We call it the question mark. Jesus was always asking questions. And, and, and as I thought about I listed all of them on the yellow, yellow pads. And I spent the next several weeks of, of my own personal devotion life just meditating on those. In fact, I wrote a book about it, The Jesus Code, 52 Scripture verses, questions every believer ought to answer. I believe there are 52 questions in the Bible that everybody ought to answer. And the more I meditated on all those verses, the more it began to dawn on me that every epoch of Christian church history, from way back there when the church was birthed on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit fell and 3,000 were saved and baptized, all through the church age, all of our forefathers, all of our brothers and sisters in Christ who lived in other generations before us, every epoch of Christian history all through this time until we come to today sitting right here in Times Square Church this morning, every epoch of Christian history has had a question that came from the lips of our Lord for whom and to whom it was particularly applicable. It was the question of their time, and it was the question, had they not answered it, the church wouldn't have moved through the centuries as it has. Take that first epoch of Christian history. You read about it in the book of Acts. The dynamic power of the acts of the Holy Spirit in the lives of those early believers spilling over in the first or second generation of the Christian church. They had a question from the lips of their Lord that was the question of their time. They had to answer it. It was the question Jesus asked in John 13, 38. And here's what he asked. Will you lay down your life for me? Will you lay down your life for my sake? Now, for most of us in this room, that's not the question of our time. But I want to tell you something. 
Had you not been so blessed to live in this century, had you lived in that first century with those first century believers, that would have been the question of your time. Will you lay down your life for me? And thousands upon thousands upon scores of thousands of them in those first few generations of Christian history died, were martyred in their deaths for the cause of the gospel. Every one of the apostles except John, Peter crucified upside down, Paul beheaded outside of the gates of Rome, uh, spilling over in the next generation, Polycarp, the great pastor of the church at Smyrna, great preacher, was burned at the stake. Ignatius, the pastor of the great missionary church at Antioch, was thrown to the wild animals who devoured his body. The Romans would take Christians and dip them in tar and hang them on hooks on big columns and set them on fire and burn them alive just so that the Caesar could have a lighted path to walk from his palace to the Colosseum Games where there they would throw more Christians to lions. They had a question for their time. Will you lay down your life for me? Will you lay down your life for my sake? And because they answered the question of their time, the church kept marching through the centuries. And as many have said, the blood of all those first century martyrs became the seed of church growth. And the church began to spread all over the Mediterranean world until we come to the second epoch of Christian history. And another question from the lips of our Lord arose, and it became the question of their time. It was a question he asked in Matthew 22, verse 42, when he asked this question. What think ye of the Christ? Whose son is he? And because I'll tell you why that was the question of their time. A heresy rose in the early church. It was led by a man named Arius who lived in Alexandria. And he began to preach and propound that Christ was not co-equal and co-existent with the Father, the Spirit, but he was created by the Father. And that heresy began to take root until it brought them to a place called Nicaea in 325 A.D. Have you ever heard of the Nicene Creed? That issued out of this council of Nicaea. And there Athanasius, the strong defender of the faith, stood before that council and and professed that Christ was co-equal and co-existent of the same nature. He was God. He was deity himself. And the church answered the question of their time. What think ye of the Christ? Whose son is he? He is God himself, clothed in human flesh. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so that we wouldn't misunderstand who he was talking about in verse 14 of John 1, it says what? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. And so the church kept marching through the centuries until we come to the next epoch of Christian history and we find the church in a dark, dark period held in the clutches of those Roman popes. And another question from the lips of our Lord arose and it became the question of their time. The question he asked in John chapter 11, verse 40. Did I not say unto you that if you would believe, if you would be people of faith and faith alone, you would see the glory of God. And armed with the question of their time and the truth of the book of Romans, a man named Martin Luther took his 95 theses and nailed them to the church door at Wittenberg, and the glory of God began to spread through Europe, through Calvin and Zwingli and Hubmeyer and Mance, our Anabaptist forefathers, and over Knox in Scotland, and that great faith movement we call the Reformation. Let the fires of revival all over the world. They answered the question of their time. And the church kept marching through the centuries. And then we come to another epoch. And the question that was their question of their time was the question Jesus asked in, in uh, Luke 18.8 when, when he asked this question. When the Son of Man returns... Will he find faith over all the earth? Burdened by that question. 
men and their wives and their children like William Carey, Hudson Taylor, David Livingston, Adoniram Judson, left the comforts and the confines of home and hearth for far away places like Africa, and India, China, Burma, and the modern missionary movement was begun and continues until this very day where we are here today as missionaries continue to go to the ends of the earth sharing the good news of the gospel because they answered the question of their time. Then come the next epoch, first part of the last century. And another question from large lips came. It was the question he asked in John 6, 67. Will, will you also go away? Think about that. Will you also go away? And we watched as one mainline denomination after another, after another, after another went away from the doctrinal truths of the Word of God, the founding principles of their own forefathers to follow after liberalism, her twin children of pluralism and inclusivism. And thank God there were people like David Wilkerson who saw that and planted a church like this to preach the gospel to the world from this place, to stand on the truth that Jesus Christ is the only way to eternal life. And so now we live in our epoch of Christian history. And another question from the lips of our Lord has become, that becomes a question of our time. And we must answer it. Just as much as that first epoch answered theirs, it's not will you lay down your life for me. It's not what thank you the Christ whose son is he. We've already settled that way back there in Nicaea. It's not, did, did I not say to you, if you believe, you'd see the glory of God. We're people of faith and faith alone. It's not when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith over the earth? It's not, will you also go away? We've settled that question, but we have a question for our time. That's the question of our time. It's the question he asks in, in Matthew 16, 15. We'll get to it a little bit later, but here's the question. Who do you say that I am? That's the question of our time. In a world of pluralistic thought all around us that's telling everybody everywhere that if Jesus is anything, he's just one of many ways. He's asking you and me, who do you say? Not who you think. Who do you profess? Who are we letting the world know? Who do you say that I am. You see, there are only two kinds of leadership, no matter where you are. There are those who lead by public consensus. Some people lead by that. In other words, they don't take a stand on an issue until they figure out what everybody else wants to do. Some people try to leave their families like that. That's why kids are in charge of so many families. This is political season, so we just think about it more in political season, how some people won't take a stand, some politicians won't take a stand on an issue until all the polling data gets in. And they see what the people want to do. So some people lead by public consensus. Then there are other people who lead by personal conviction. Down deep in the core of the fiber of their being, they have some convictions about what's right and what's wrong. And they lead that way, no matter what anybody says or no matter what, what comes their way. It's personal conviction. Now, it was at this very point that Jesus took the disciples away from the Galilean crowds in Matthew 16. They'd been immersed down there on the northern shore of the Galilee. Thousands and thousands of people had flocked down there. They had been expending themselves. Uh, Jesus had been preaching and healing and multitudes of people came and those disciples were immersed in it, expending themselves physically and emotionally and spiritually. And Jesus took them away from those crowds, got them alone, walked them 20 miles to the north, all the way up to the headwaters of the Jordan River, the foothills of Mount Hermon to a place Caesar had built in, uh, to Philip had built in honor of the Caesar that the Bible calls Caesarea Philippi. And there we find our text in Matthew 16, beginning in verse 13. Now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am? Do you see that, that question there, verse 13? That is the question 
a public consensus. What's the polling data showing? Who do, who, do, who do men say? Anthropos, generic, men, women, boys, girls, the people. Who, what, what are they saying out there? Who do people say that I am? That's the question of public consensus. What's the polling data showing? And so the disciples said in the next verse, well, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're just another one of the prophets. And then look at the question he asked in verse 15. He says, but wait a minute. Who do you say that I am? Do you see the difference? That's not the question of public consensus. That is the question of personal conviction. That's the question of our time. But not only that, for many of you in this room and online, that is the question of eternity. Who do you say that I am? And God bless Simon Peter. He was there. We rag on Simon Peter all the time. We say he was boisterous. He was boastful. He was proud. He, he denied the Lord. He, but here, in the next verse, he's inspired of the Holy Ghost. And he says, I know who you are. I know. I confess. I know. You're the Christ. Ho Christos. Strongest article in Greek. The one and only anointed one, Messiah, the Christ. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he made that great confession. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, you son of Jonah, because flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. But the Holy Ghost, my Father in heaven, revealed that to you. Now, I want to tell you something. For some of you here today, that's what's happening with you. That's what's going to happen to you in this service in just a moment. Flesh and blood's not going to reveal this to you. Human persuasion's not going to reveal this to you. But the Spirit of God is. And you are going to join Peter today in making that great confession. Before you leave here, some of you for the first time in your life are going to say you're the Christ. The Son of the living God. Cleanse me of my sin. Come into my life. And you'll begin the great adventure for which you were created in the first place. To know him. So two brief points today, and, and you can thank God for this. I'm going to preach a lot shorter than your pastor does, so you'll get out of here a little bit early. <laughs> but I want to tell you something. I've preached this sermon before. It took me two hours one time to preach it because the folks weren't with me. I just couldn't, couldn't get it. I preached it in 15 or 20 minutes when I thought people were with me and they were getting me. I didn't have to walk around the point a long time. Are you, are you with me? Okay, I thought you might be. All right, let's, let's look at verse 13, and then we'll look at verse for two points. Here's the first one. The question of public consensus. It's in verse 13. Jesus asked this, who do the people say? Who do men say that I am? And what happened? Whoosh! Those disciples got in their little holy huddle. They did that a lot. They started talking to each other said, man, did you hear what he just asked? Who, who the people say? And they'd been down there among the crowds. They had all their polling data they had taken. And one of them spoke up and said, Lord, I heard them saying, I, I, they're saying you're John the Baptist. John the Baptist had just lost his head. Literally. <laughs> and one of them said, some are saying that the spirit of John the Baptist has come back and he's in you. That you're John the Baptist. Another one said, well, I, I've been down there. I've been listening. That's not what I hear. Them say. I hear them saying, you're Elijah. He was the man of prayer. By, by now, they'd seen God do, Christ do so much by prayer. Another one said, well, no, no. My polling data shows me that most of them are saying you're Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. Later, they would see Jesus weep at the tomb of Lazarus. Standing next to those two broken-hearted sisters, Mary and Martha, and he was touched by the feeling of their infirmities. And some of you here today with heavy hearts, and he still weeps with you. He's touched by your feelings. They would see him weep on Palm Sunday Road. You see, at, at, at Bethany, he wept over our sorrows because he's touched by our broken hearts. On Palm Sunday Road, he wept over our sins because he's troubled by our blinded eyes. He said, oh, 
I would have gathered you under my wing as a hen does her young, but you would not. And the Bible says in the sh that Jesus, when he saw the city, he wept over it. Listen, if he saw the city in Jerusalem and wept over it, how much more do you think when he sees the city of New York City that he's weeping today over the sins of the people? Another spoke up and said, no, that's not what my data shows. It says they're saying you're just another one of the prophets. That, that's what our, our Muslim friends think. That he's just, no, they revere him, but he was just another one of the prophets. Just not as great as what they say is the last one, Muhammad. You see what happens? We're living in a world that never gets out of verse 13. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, we're living in a world where what men say, who do men say that I am? Who do people say? We're living in a world where what men say is far more important to most people than what God says. And that's the world we live in. I saw it this morning. I picked up the newspaper. and You, you know what I read in your newspaper? Big bold letters up there. It said, opinion section. You know what I thought? I thought, why isn't there a conviction section in this Bible? Why doesn't Tim or Carter or somebody, why don't they ask them to write a conviction section about what God says in the Bible? You know why? Because what men say is a lot more important to most people than what God says. And we live in that kind of a world. Recently, I, I, re I heard somebody say that Jesus never drew lines for people. He only drew circles and included everybody. Like the woman who ta was taken in adultery. He said, neither do I condemn you. He took her into his circle. But you know what? He drew a line. He said, go and sin no more. Go and sin. Can you imagine if Jesus were here physically in our generation today and appeared on The View or one of these talk shows <laughs> and said what he said in the New Testament? Think about it. He's up there and one of those ladies is interviewing him and everything, talking about her husband. He says, wait just a second. That guy you're talking about, he's not your husband. In fact, you've had five husbands and that guy you're living with now ain't your husband. That's what he said to the woman at the well. They'd say, you bigot. What right do you have to say that? Why? why? Because we, that's the culture we're in. It never gets out of verse 13. Some of you here today are more interested in what men say and think about you than what God says. Who do men say that? Now, you know what happens when we live in a world like that? When what men say is more important than what God says, it gives rise to two things. Pluralistic compromise and political correctness. Now, in our theological jargon, pluralistic compromise, that's pluralism. That just means we're all going to heaven, some people teach, but there are a plurality of ways till we get there. We're all going to heaven, we're just going on different roads. So, um, Muslims go on one road, and Buddhists go on one road, and Hindus go on one road, and Mormons go on one road, and our Jewish friends go on one road, and Catholics go on one road, and Jehovah Witnesses go on one road, and, and we evangelicals go on one We're all going the same place. Uh, we're just getting there on different roads. You see, when what men say is more important than what God said, that's what people believe. But it not only pluralistic compromise, but political correctness. Now, in theological jargon, you know what political correctness is? It's, it's, called in, in a, it's called inclusivism in theological jargon. That by that, it just means everybody is included in the atonement. In other words, it borders right there on the border of, of universalism. Everybody's going to be saved anybody, anyway. Nobody's going to hell. There's no hell. Everybody's going to heaven. Uh, universalism. Now... Why should we be concerned about those two things? Pluralism. It affects our doctrine. What we believe. Our message. Because if we believe there are all these different roads you can go on to heaven, 
what difference does doctrinal truth mean anymore? So what? What does it mean? What difference does it mean if Jesus was born of a virgin? If he lived a sinless life? If he died a victorious death? If he bodily arose from the grave? If he ascended on all the great doctrinal Christological truths would mean nothing. It affects our doctrine, what we believe, our message. What about inclusivism, this idea that everybody's going to heaven? It affects our duty, how we behave as believers, our mission. Because you see, if we believe that everybody's going to heaven anyway, why would we ever give a public invitation for people to come and be saved? Why would we ever talk about evangelism? Why would we ever send a missionary anywhere to share the gospel of Jesus Christ? It affects our duty, how we behave. So you see, the question of public consensus is not for us. And for some of you in this room or online who live in a world, in your own world, perhaps bordered on the north, south, east, and west by the fact that what men say is more important than what God says, then this question of public uh, uh, consensus, living your life more concerned about what other people thought about you than what God thinks is about to change. Because there's another question from the lips of our Lord. And we move now from this question of public consensus to the question of personal conviction. Look what Jesus said, verse 15. That's not what I want to know, he said. Not what people are thinking. Here's my question. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? You see, there's, a, there's, a, there's an alternative to pluralism and inclusivism. What is it? It's what we call the exclusivity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's what Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 26, when he said, I am a way. Oh no, he didn't say that, did he? I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no one, not a few, not some, no one, comes to the Father except through me. Now, do you think, do you think when David Wilkerson over 60 years ago, Assembly of God, pastor of a small church, got a burden on his heart for the gangs here in, in the boroughs of New York and came over there to Prospect Park not knowing anybody, Tim's daddy being a policeman there that said what? Let the man preach. And David Wilkerson came into those gangs in those days. Nikki Cruz. You think David came into Nikki and said, Nikki, there are many ways you can get to heaven now. You, you, you boys could start being nice. And not, not, be, not be trying to do the things you're doing. You can go on this road. You can go on that road. You can go on this road. You can, no. He came in there with a message that the only hope for you is Jesus Christ. And turning your life over to Christ and letting Christ come in and make a new creation out of you. All things can pass away and all can become new. You think he started Teen Challenge? I say, now listen, we're going to get you off all these drugs and stuff. Listen, it's just, a, I want you just to, just to think some positive thoughts. <laughs> no. He said, there's no deliverance. Jesus is the only one that can deliver. Me. Jesus is the way. We sang it this morning. Jesus is the way. He's the only one that can set you free. Here is the question of personal conviction. Who do you say that I am. Now back, back for just a moment to Caesarea Philippi. There they are around the fire. And, and he asked the question. Now, if you're reading it in the language of the New Testament, it's emphatic. Now, that, by that it means he takes the you and puts it at the front of the sentence structure. If we'd been there at Caesarea Philippi and listening to Jesus, the way he answered his question, here's the way he asked the question. What about you? What about you? That's what he said. You, you only, you alone. What about you? 
You and you alone. You and you only. You and nobody else. You. Who do you say that I am? That's the way he asks the question. This isn't about whoever's sitting next door to you or next in the chair to you today. This is about you. This is a question he asks of you. Who do you say? Not who do you think. Who are you going to prefer? Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him. And he's so beautiful. He answered emphatically the same way. He put you. Here's the way Peter answered if you'd have heard him. He said it like this. He said, you, Lord, and you alone. You and no possibility of anybody else. You and you only. You and you alone. You are the only Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus is the only way. What motivated Simon Peter, who made that great confession, to die his martyr's death? You know how Peter died? We don't know for sure, but tradition tells us this. It says that he and his wife were crucified at the same time, and he watched first as she was brutally and viciously crucified in front of him. Then when it came time for Peter to be crucified, he made a strange request. He requested, he said, I'm not worthy to be crucified in the same way as my Savior. And he requested he be crucified upside down. And that's why when you go into these liturgical churches, you see the signs and the marks of the apostles. Peter's is an inverted cross symbolizing the way he died. What motivated Peter to die that martyr's death, that cruel, vicious martyr's death? Did he give his life because he believed in pluralism? Because he believed there are all these different roads that led to heaven? People don't give their lives for that. He gave his life because he insisted that Jesus Christ was the only way to eternal life. And he would not recant from that. And he gave his life for that. And I would to God I could bring that great fisherman, that big fisherman. I wish he was standing over there right now in the wings. And I'd say, Peter, come out here. And that big old callous-handed fisherman walk out here on this stage. And i say, Peter, tell, tell the folks today. Testify today about what I'm preaching here. He'd say the same thing to you. He said in Acts 4.12. He'd look at you this morning and he'd say, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. What motivated Paul? Do you know that Paul gave you over half your New Testament? What motivated, motivated Paul to die his martyr's death? Outside the city gates of Rome, they took him. And on a big block, he laid out his head and neck. And a muscular man with a big axe brought that axe down and decapitated him in one swing. What led him? die like that. He didn't have to. He could have recanted. Did Paul give his life because he believed in inclusivism, that everybody's going to heaven anyway? Nobody dies for that. He gave his life because he insisted that Jesus Christ is the only way to eternal life. And oh, how I wish he was standing in those wings. I could say, Paul, come here. And you know what you'd see? You'd see a little old Jew bent over. He was beaten, stoned at Lystra and left for dead. Beaten with a cat of nine tails, 39 lashes once. Shipwrecked at Malta. Every bone almost in his body had been broken. And I wish I could bring him out here today and say, testify to these people about the exclusivity of Christ. You know what he'd say to you? He'd say the same thing to you. He said in the first letter he ever wrote, it's in your New Testament called Galatians chapter 1, verse 8. He'd look at you and he'd say, should we or some angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you? Let him be accursed. Christ is the only way to eternal life. 
I wish I could bring John. He didn't die a martyr's death. The only apostle that didn't. But at 90 years of age, he was exiled on Patmos. You know what Revelation 1-9 says? He says, I was on the island called Patmos. You say, oh, that's nice. Old man got retirement, got to go to something like, oh, that must have been like the Isle of Capri or Mykonos or one of those Greek islands. No. You know what, Pat? Patmos was a, like Alcatraz. Barren. It was a rock of an island. And the Romans, when they would conquer a people, you know what they'd do? They'd empty all the prisons out because they didn't want to have to deal with those criminals. And they'd put them on ships and they'd sail them to this Greek island of Patmos and dump them there. Then they would go back and they'd take all the mental institutions and all the mental problems that were there and put them on ships and dump them on Patmos. And John said, I was, there's so much behind that. He said, I was on the island called Patmos. But you know what he said? But I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. I want to tell you something. For some of you here this morning, sometime I want to come back and preach on this text because it's beautiful. It's not where you are. It's whose you are that matters most. I may be speaking to somebody today that's on Patmos. And you said, I'm on the Isle of Patmos, filled with limitations and liabilities and loneliness. But stop, that's only half the story. You can finish the sentence today, but I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. It's not where you are today, it's whose you are. And that who has come to your heart today to ask you this question, who do you say that I am? So I wish I could bring John, over 90 years of age, that old man out here. Say, John, tell these people about the gospel of Christ. What do you think? Are we telling the truth today? He'd say the same thing to you. He said in his little epistle, First John, and in his gospel, he'd look at you today and he'd say, he that hath the Son hath life. But he that hath not the Son hath not life, and the wrath of God abides on him. Now, you know what happens when we say that Christ is the only way to eternal life? Now, most of my life, I've been a Baptist. Most people think Baptists, and most of them are, sadly, so narrow-minded that a gnat could stand on the bridge of their nose and peck out of both eyes at the same time. Think how narrow-minded that would be. But you know what? That's the nature of truth. Listen to this. It's the nature of all Truth is narrow. All truth is narrow. We say Christ is the only way to eternal life. Theological truth is no different from all other truth. All truth is narrow. Mathematical truth is narrow. Two plus two equals four. Boy, y'all are smart people. Four. I used to get so upset when I was in kindergarten, first grade, and I'd put five there, and that teacher would get that big old red pencil and make a big X over it. I was so close. I, I, can't you cut me a little slack? I only missed it by one. Why wouldn't she cut me any slack? Because mathematical truth is narrow. How about scientific truth? Scientific truth is more narrow than anything. You want me to illustrate it? Water freezes at what? 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, it's going to get cold here in a few days. But you take a glass of water and sit it out on your windowsill at night when it's 34 or 35 degrees and sit there and watch it and wait for it to freeze. And something else will freeze over before that water does. You know why? Because water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. That is narrow. Historical truth is narrow. John Wilkes Booth shot Abraham Lincoln in the Ford Theater in Washington, D.C. He didn't stab him in the Bowery here in lower Manhattan. Historical truth is narrow. Geographical truth is narrow. I live in Texas. We're bordered with Oklahoma by the Red River, not the Sabine River. I could go on and on and on to illustrate the fact that all truth is narrow. So why should we be surprised? That theological truth is narrow. Jesus said, enter in where? By the straight gate. For what? Narrow 
is the way that leads to life. And few there be that find it. Who do you say that I am? Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one, no one, no one in the balcony, no one on the lower floor, no one online, no one, any time, any place, anywhere, comes to the Father unless he comes through me. Jesus is the only way to the Father's house. My mentor put it like this. He said, I think of that grand and glorious day when all the redeemed of all the ages of all time, every tongue, every tribe, every nation, every people are gathered around the throne of God as we read about in the Revelation, worshiping and praising the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ upon the throne. And in the midst of that great worship scene, I look and here come the patriarchs of the Old Testament. They come walking by, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Joseph, I've written books literally about their lives and their leadership. And here they are, and, and they come walking by. But I'm not one of them. And then I look, and here come the sweet psalmist of Israel, David, Asaph, the sons of Korah. I've memorized so many of those psalms. And so many times of heartache and need They've come to my heart and comfort those psalms. And here come the sweet psalmist of Israel. And they come walking by and, and they walk right past me and I see them, but, but I'm not one of them. And then I see a group over here. The, they're, oh man, they're kind of strutting like this. The prophets of the Old Testament. Isaiah. There's Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and Haggai and Zephaniah and Zechariah. Malachi and all the prophets of the Old Testament, and they come walking by, but I'm not one of them. And then I look. Look at that. Here come the glorious apostles of the New Testament. James and John, the sons of thunder. There's Andrew and Peter. Peter wouldn't even have been there if Andrew hadn't have first found his own brother and brought him to Jesus. There's Nathaniel who was under the fig tree. He had no guile and Bartholomew and Thomas and Thaddeus and, and the great apostles of the New Testament. They come walking by. But I'm not one of them. And then I see a big host of people come. The martyrs of the church. We've talked about some of them there's Peter and there's, there's Paul. There's all the apostles and there's Perpetua, that young mother put to death in Carthage. And, and, and there's, there's uh, Savannah Rolla burned at the stake in, in Florence. And, and, and there's Polycarp and Ignatius and all those church fathers. And, and there's, there's, there's Tyndale. You read your Bible in English because Tyndale was burned at the stake because he translated it into English. And Huss... And all and on. And, and more and more today, the martyrs of the church, and they come walking by. But I'm not one of them. And then I look. And I behold a multitude of people which no man can number. Who are these? These are they whose robes have been washed white in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I belong to that glorious throng of the redeemed. Look and live. Wash and be clean. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood. Lose all their guilty stains. We have a question of our time. For you, for some of you, it's a question of eternity. Who do you say? Not who do you think, but today, who are you going to profess? Who do you say that I am? Let's bow our hearts together and our heads together across this room. You'll decide by either one of two ways. Public consensus. You may be more concerned what other people think about you than what God thinks. Or by personal conviction. 
The Spirit of God comes to your heart today. No one comes to the Father unless they're drawn. That's God's Spirit knocking at your heart's door. That's God's Spirit pulling at your heartstrings, saying, come, you blessed of my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That's Jesus saying, come, come to me, come to Jesus, come to Jesus. And you know what? <clears throat> your sins, he'll wash away. He'll make it as if it never happened. He'll separate your sin from you as far as the east is from the west and remember it no more. You'll be a brand new beginning. And Christ will come and live in your life and give you the purpose and power to live the Christian life. Who do you say? Who do you profess that I am? Would you join Peter as the Holy Spirit leads you as he led Peter to say, I know who you are. I've always known, but today I want to claim it and I want to confess it. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Save me. Come into my life. And let me begin this great adventure for which you created me in the first place. Thank you so much, Thanks, Lois. That is the question, but that question needs a response today. And it's going to call for a response. Balcony, main floor, those that are watching around the country and around the world, it is going to call for a, for a response from you. The, the, the part that is so important right now is that you have the opportunity to respond. I have friends here that are in, in from out of town because they're going to a wedding. How come they're going to the wedding? They were invited and then they RSVP'd. You know what that is. That's, that's when you begin to say, I, I got the invitation, now I want to go. That's what heaven is called. Heaven is called a great wedding day. It's called the wedding feast. It's when you get the invitation like OS was talking about. And you've got to ask yourself today, as you begin to declare you are the Christ, how do, how do you get there? How do you get into How do the doors of heaven open up to you today? Listen for this for just a moment. Because some of you have come up with so many different answers to this. You've come up with the answer, well, I'm a good person. Well, I'm, well I've, I, I've gone to church. I'm religious. I don't hurt anybody. I provide for my family. I've had communion. I go to the mosque. I've gone to the cathedral. I've been confirmed. I've been water baptized. Can we just establish something? You can be water baptized. You can go, if you are a sinner and you go down in that water, let me just help you, let me help you. You are coming up the same way you went in there. There is no magic water. It is only what Jesus does inside of every single one of us. That's where it starts. Let me, let me explain it to you. How does the doors of heaven open up? I have to tell you this. When OS was speaking and he was walking through that revelation, that mighty host that's going to be there. Let me tell you what just went through my heart. I want to date myself for a second. I, 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 this, do, do you remember before there was even the technology that would just pick people up, that if you wanted to go in through a grocery store, remember you had to step on that rubber mat that used to, how many remember the rubber mat when you used to have to go, okay, this is the, this is the younger service because you guys are looking at me. Listen, when we grew up, there wasn't, there wasn't these, 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 these lights that picked us up, this infrared that picked you up and the doors opened up. There would be this, there would be this rubber mat that, you, that weight, when weight was on it, the doors would open up. But it was amazing to watch when you'd watch young children get on it. They could jump up and down. Those things wouldn't open up for nothing because it needed weight to open it up. And what's incredible is, is I remember there were times that I would even watch it with my own kids and then you'd have to put your foot on there, not that I was overweight. I'd put my foot on there to open those things up. Folks, let me just tell you something. You can jump up and down and going, I'm a good person. I go to the mosque. I go to Times Square Church. I go to... Until Jesus steps on that thing with you at that point and you say, God, those doors don't open up unless Jesus is right there. You can't go to heaven without Jesus. And that can happen today. It's RSVPing today. You, you got the message. Now it's time to respond. 
And here's what we do. You, when, you're, when you're responding to say, I'm going to the wedding, I'm going to the party, let me tell you what you don't do. You don't close your eyes and bow your heads. Your eyes are open and you see exact. So let me just help you today. We're not even going to close our eyes and, and bow our heads. We're going to go, Jesus, get on this thing with me and open up the doors of heaven. I want forgiveness. I want eternity. I want you to come in. And the question is this, who do you say that he is? And today we're going to say, you are my Savior. You are my King. You are my Lord. Don't tell me, well, I, 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 he, he is my friend. He's got to be Lord and Savior of your life today. I want to pray with you today. I want to ask that God come in and change you from the inside out. I want to believe that today you are going to be what Jesus says. You are going to be born again. Just as you had a first birth physically, you're going to have a second birth spiritually. That first birth was maybe for most of you in a hospital, but that second birth is going to happen right now on 51st and Broadway. It's going to happen on a computer screen or a TV screen as you're watching right now around the world. And I'm going to believe for God to do it. If you're here today and say, Pastor Tim, when you pray that born again prayer, I'm RSVPing today. I'm tired. I'm, I'm, I am to this day. I thought I had enough of weight to open those doors, but I need Jesus to come and stand right with me today. You don't have enough of weight. Well, you don't understand. I work on Wall Street. You don't have enough of weight, enough of money to open up the door. You need Jesus. And you can sit here today and go, but I'm a Muslim. I don't drink. I haven't done anything wrong. I've have, I, I, listen, that doesn't, that doesn't get you there. Islam. Judaism and here it comes news flash neither can Times Square Church we can't get you there only Jesus can he's it that's it and if you're here today with everybody looking around unashamedly and say pastor Tim when you pray that born-again prayer I want I want in get me I want today to be the day is my second birth date I was born on December 22nd. No need to worry about the year. December 22nd. That was my first birth. Second birth can happen today. Second birth is when God has changed you from the inside out. Don't leave this place with that question unanswered. Leave this place RSVPing today. If that's you, everybody here looking around online, if you're saying, Pastor Tim, put me in that prayer. Hold up your hand right now. Say, put me in that prayer. Hold it up as high as you can. I want to make sure I see every hand that's up. Yes, 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 yes. Gotcha, gotcha. There, 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 there. I want to make sure I see a balcony, 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 balcony. I want to make sure I see every hand. Yes, yes, got you in the corner. Here's what I want you to do. Listen. It, all the way back there got you got you two hands this is what I'm going to ask you to do if your hands are up I want you to come right here get down here as fast as you can just go ahead who cares what anybody else thinks right now who if don't live by public consensus don't care what it, this is my time quickly get down here as fast as you can I love when people get down here fast you get down look at this all of this come on down I like you got down here fast balcony we're waiting for you balcony we're waiting for you this is a moment for God to do something really special right now come on we're gonna believe for God I thank God for all of you coming today I thank God that you're here today I thank God that he has brought you here balcony we'll wait just a few moments as you guys are coming down we are giving thanks that God is saving people's lives say come on we got a whole group coming here over there we're gonna wait for you we're gonna wait for you we're gonna wait for you if you're online, I want you just to type in the word decided. I'm going to tell you what to do next. You type in the word decided. Come on, come on, you guys. Come on all down. This is amazing. I'm so happy that you guys made it. You guys match here. Is this husband and, husband and wife? First time here? You've been here before. Awesome. This is fantastic. God is going to do something very special. Let me tell you something. God's hand is upon your life. God's hand is upon your life. Those tears that you, that you feel, sir, those tears that you feel, this is God about to come, and he's about to clean your heart out right now. He's about to clean your heart out right now. He's going to clean your heart out. That's what he's come to do. You sense his presence here. You sense God's. That's what it was. God was moving you to get down here. That's, that's, that's what, he was, what he was wanting to do the whole time. You know, I, I, 
I hardly ever do this because I because we're going I, we're always over time because the guy who usually preaches goes way too long so let me just say this but I feel strongly to say this if you have an RSVP and you're supposed to be down here get out of your seat now don't don't go by public consensus seriously just get down here come on come on come on if you're going I need to get down here and I didn't come I didn't come come on you get your come on there you are sir come on get down here Come on, God is going to do something. I want this to be that RSVP moment. That RSVP moment. Come on, I see you coming down. This is that moment. This is that moment. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Come on, orange shirts. Come on, orange hoodies. Come on, orange hoodies. Get down here fast. Come on, orange hoodies. You got it. You got it. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Come on. Come on, I see you. I just feel so strongly that we had to do this. God's doing something. God's doing something. Hallelujah. Another orange hoodie. Come on. I'm so happy the orange hoodies are in the house. Fantastic. These orange hoodies are from all over the place. I'm so I'm, I'm hearing from my new friend down here. Quickly, this is it. I'm gonna wait. This, this. I'm gonna wait for you two guys to get down here. This is that important. This is that important. God is doing something special. Here's what's awesome. Today is the day of so. Come on, come on, come on. Get down here. Get down here. We'll wait for you. Thank you, OS, for preaching. This is this is the fruit because you've presented Jesus. If Jesus be lifted up, he draws men to him. So here's what we're going to do. I want us to pray this prayer together. I want all over this place, online, or around the country. Let's, come on, can we pray this out loud together? Say these words with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. Come on, now let's say this loud. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. Hallelujah.